Okay, so in today's class uh, we are going to continue our discussion of uh, the relativistic uh, nature of Maxwell's equation. So, if you recall in the last class I had shown um, how the uh, collection of density and components of current form a relativistic 4 vector. So, if you remember I had, uh, I had pointed out that uh, you can construct this uh, object which has 4 components namely the first components is the density, uh, the other 3 components are the uh, uh, x, y, z uh, components of the current density. So, you have uh, particle uh, density and current density. So, by uh, demanding that the equation of continuity be the same in uh, both the original reference frame and the Lorentz boosted uh, reference frame, you will be able to conclude that this is possible only if the, uh, the currents and densities transform in this way and then we just derived that this is, this is nothing but C 0 0 is gamma which is you know the parameter that de determines uh, length contraction uh, in relativity and this is going to be V by C squared minus V by C squared gamma. So, this is very closely reminiscent of uh, uh, you know T dash going to gamma into T minus V by C squared into X. So, in other words uh, T is analogous to rho and X is analogous to J X. So, in other words uh, rho and j transform exactly the same way as t and x transform under Lorentz transformations. Okay, so, t and uh, so rather rho and j x transform the same way as uh, t and j x transform under Lorentz transformation. So, now uh, that is so much for uh, currents and densities. Now, I am going to go and uh, prove to you that uh, the rest of Maxwell's equations are also consistent with special relativity. So, in order to do this uh, you look at the uh, Maxwell's equation. So, if you, you must know that there are 4 Maxwell's equations, 2 of which involve sources, the other 2 do not involve sources and they refer to uh, the ones that do not involve sources are basically uh, the ones that uh, you know the the Faraday's law and basically the other one which tells you the uh, fact that magnetic field does not uh, diverge. Okay. So, the point is that the source uh, Maxwell equations with sources are the Gauss law and Ampere's law. So, this is Gauss law, the first one is Gauss law and the other is Ampere's law. Now, I am uh, remember that I have just proved to you that the sources namely rho and j uh, transform as components of a 4 vector under Lorentz boosts. So, now the question is uh, given that information and given these 2 Maxwell's equation the question is uh, how do the electric and magnetic fields transform under Lorentz transformation. So, I am going to postulate that these equations uh, have the same form under Lorentz transformation. So, in other words this equation looks exactly the same when I replace the gradients with the corresponding gradients in the boosted frame and the electric field so on and so forth. So, now you see uh, I go ahead and uh, explicitly write down the components and uh, so it is going to be a little lengthy because uh, I am going to work it out uh, component by component. And uh, when I do that you see that the first one is a scalar equation, but the second one is a vector equation. So, that the second one uh, splits up into 3 separate equations for each of the components. Okay. So, now keep in mind that j dash x is related to j x and rho. So, which is what I have written here. So, I have uh, been able to write uh, and then uh, the gradients themselves can be written because I know how the positions and times. Uh, change uh, under Lorentz transformation. So, that means the gradients are also uh, correspondingly uh, they get uh, linearly combined in this fashion under Lorentz transformation. So, when I do all this I put them all together uh, it is it's going to start to look like this. Okay. So, uh, so these, these 3 equations can be made to for example, this equation can be made to look like this the, the one involving 
the derivatives of uh, b dash can be made to look like this. But then keep in mind that the original uh, in the original reference frame these were the equations. Okay. So, then you can eliminate rho and j from 3 2 by using 3 24. So, you see so, uh, I am going to eliminate rho and j from uh, from this equation by looking at uh, by using this. So, uh, so, 4 pi by c j x is uh, given by the rest of it. So, I, so wherever there is 4 pi by c j x I can replace it by the b's themselves. So, then you stare at this then you, uh, you compare the two sides and then you will immediately conclude. So, you see what I have done right. So, basically what I have done is that I have taken the j x which is from here and then I have substituted uh, the corresponding uh, j x into this. Okay. So, then I get this so I have eliminated j x as it were. So, so, remember that there is only this source right and similarly rho also I have, I have eliminated that way okay, by using this. So, so, I write 4 pi rho as uh, d by dx of e x and so on and so forth. So, that is what I have done here right. So, having done that you see you simply compare the two sides. Uh, so, then you will conclude that uh, that this is valid only when e x is the same as e x dash b x is same as the b x dash, but b z dash is given by this interesting formula it is gamma into b z minus v by c into e y okay. and then b dash y is similarly this. Okay. So, similarly if you look at 3.18 okay, so which is your z component and then you again eliminate the sources and then you look at the different terms. So, you will get the rest of the transformation. So, so this will tell you all the how the b's transform b dash how does b dash transform b dash x b dash y b dash z. So, b dash x b dash z b dash y. So, we know how b transforms, but here from equation 3.20 you only know you know how all the b's transform, but you know only how one of the x, com x components of electric field transform only one of the components of electric fields how they transform. But if you want to know the rest you just look at any one of the other ones like 3.18 and they do the same thing eliminate sources then you will conclude that the other components transform in a very similar way. So, this is pretty much the whole story that means you now we have successfully told you how the components of the currents uh, and the density transform under Lorentz transformation. So, now uh, we have also successfully uh, said that uh, how the electric and magnetic fields transform under Lorentz. So, now uh, having done this we are uh, now ready to make uh, further interesting observations about the relativistic nature of the electromagnetic field. So, one of the important observations is that uh, if you square the electric field uh, you will see that in the primed reference frame and the unprimed reference frame they of course, uh, are going to be related the square of the electric field in the primed reference frame is related in a complicated way to the uh, electric fields and the magnetic fields in the unprimed reference frames. But however, when you take the difference between the so I have to also uh, remind you that I am working in CGS units. So, that in CGS units the electric and magnetic fields are the same units same dimensions. So, that is why I am able to do this. Okay. So, if I subtract these two that will be the square of the electric field in the prime reference frame uh, minus the square of the magnetic field in the prime reference frame. You will see that uh, the complicated uh, dependence on the right hand side especially the dependence on the boost factors uh, namely the relative velocity between the reference frames disappears and you have this very beautiful result which says that e squared minus b squared is independent of which reference frame you are looking at. So, in other words is a Lorentz invariant. So, um, similarly you can also show that e dot b is a Lorentz invariant. Okay. So, uh, if e dot b has a certain value in a certain reference frame it has the same value when you uh, move to a different reference frame 
which is moving relative to this frame. So, this sort of completes the proof and a description of the relativistic nature of the electromagnetic field. Uh, so, remember that it is we have uh, done a thorough job because we have also included sources. So, it is the most general description of the electromagnetic field. But now, we can go one step further and uh, introduce certain uh, uh, quantities which are called potentials. So, uh, see uh, the, the way electric and magnetic field transforms uh, they are not exactly similar to 4 vectors, uh, but they somewhat uh, resemble 4 vectors, but not quite. The, however, you see the densities and currents are exactly like 4 vectors. So, if you, if you go back and see this, uh, rho dash transforms exactly the way T dash does. So, remember that T dash is gamma T minus V by C squared x. So, similarly, rho dash is gamma rho minus V by C squared J x. So, it is as if rho is interchangeable with T and rho dash is interchangeable with T dash and J x is interchangeable with x. So, the bottom line is that you see that rho and J x, J y, J z form a 4 vector, but however, E x, E y, E z uh, uh, of course, there is no vector 4 fourth component at all in the case of electric and magnetic field. There are 6 uh, spatial components namely E x, E y, E z and B x, B y, B z, there is no analogous time component. So, it is hardly surprising that uh, electric and magnetic fields do not transform as 4 vectors. However, we want to write electric and magnetic fields in such a way in terms of other things which we can identify as 4 vectors. So, we want to write the electric and magnetic field in terms of quantities which finally transform like 4 vectors. So, to do that we introduce what are called uh, electric uh, uh, basically we introduce what are called scalar potentials and vector potentials. So, you will see that the scalar potential transforms as the time component of a 4 vector, the vector potential transforms as the, uh, the space component of the 4 vector. So, that is the reason why we introduce potentials. So, it is to uh, make the analogy with uh, special relativity uh, as close to um, the spatial coordinates as possible. So, the electric field uh, can always be written like this because uh, see I, I choose to introduce quantities called uh, phi and a which uh, obey this. Okay. So, you will see that this, uh, this sort of uh, identification immediately solves the source free Maxwell's equation. So, namely this uh, no divergence of magnetic field that is the uh, lack of magnetic monopoles is uh, obeyed by this uh, correspondence and uh, the Faraday's law which, which basically tells you that curl of E is minus, uh, minus 1 by C d by dt of B is automatically. So, if you take curl on both sides you get back this uh, Faraday's law. So, these are the source free Maxwell's equation that are automatically obeyed by uh, this uh, choice. So, now you go ahead and ask yourself uh, how do phi and A transform under Lorentz transformation. We can answer that of course, because we already know how E and B transform under Lorentz transformation. We have found that E and B do not transform well even though the transformation laws are simple, they still do not uh, transform like 4 vectors. However, we expect now that phi and A should transform like 4 vectors, namely phi is the time component of a certain 4 vector and uh, A is the spatial component of that 4 vector. So, to prove this uh, let us go ahead and uh, find out how E transforms under Lorentz transformation when expressed in terms of the potentials. See when expressed in terms of the potentials you see that as usual you write down the gradients and the time derivatives also in terms of uh, the Lorentz transformed versions. And then now you go ahead and uh, so you know that the x component of the electric field does not transform at all, but the y component transforms in this peculiar way. So, the y component transforms uh, it gets mixed up with the z component of the magnetic field. So, when you do all that and you insert it into your uh, earlier transform, transformed uh, electric field in terms of the potentials then you will be successful in proving this uh, transformation 
for um, both the inverse and the forward and backwards uh, transforms. So, in other words, you will be successful in proving that the uh, vector potential in the transformed frame transforms like this, whereas the scalar potential transforms like this. So, you can see that uh, this, ha this is certainly reminiscent of uh, uh, what we would normally associate with. Uh, uh, so, so, this phi by c is uh, analogous to time and uh, a x is analogous to x and a y is analogous to y and a z is analogous to z. So, you can see that, uh, so if you think of this as x dash, I mean analogously. So, this is going to be uh, x dash is gamma x minus v uh, phi is uh, phi by c is t. So, so you will get back uh, your familiar result that x dash is uh, gamma into x minus v t. So, you can see that uh, from here that phi by c and a x a y a z are transforming exactly like the components of a 4 vector. So, now uh, you see, uh, so I, I have uh, in this uh, description purposely avoided using uh, uh, you know these field tensor type of uh, uh, ideas which, uh, which makes all the proofs uh, very compact. So, if you write down Maxwell's equation in terms of what are called field tensors, the relativistic uh, nature of Maxwell's equations becomes so obvious is that there is nothing left to prove. But I find that that, uh, that kind of an approach uh, is somewhat opaque and it uh, you know obscures uh, some of these details of how these transformations work. So, I have purposely explicitly pointed out how the transformations work. So, that for then you can go ahead and confidently work it out uh, using the more you know concise 4 vector notation and uh, you can be confident that you have understood the underlying meaning of uh, what is happening. So, now uh, that is exactly what we are doing now. You see uh, I am going to define the 4 vector uh, in this way. So, where these are my uh, derivatives, uh, the contravariant derivatives will involve the uh, derivatives with respect to the corresponding covariant coordinates and uh, this is how uh, I define my. Uh, so, the, the field uh, tensor is called the field tensor and it is basically a collection of uh, electric and magnetic field components arranged in such a way that the field tensor is uh, fully anti-symmetric. So, in other words uh, f mu nu is minus f nu mu. So, therefore, all the diagonal components are 0 and the off diagonal components are negative of each other. So, basically uh, you see that there are uh, uh, so, if a skew symmetric uh, 4 by 4 matrix, the number of independent components are only 6 because uh, these are the only independent components. This once you specify this, this is already known because it is the negative of that. You specify this, this is already known, this is specify this is already known. Similarly, if you specify this, this is known, you specify this, this is known and so on. So, you have totally 6. So, so, that is perfect because uh, we know that we need 6. So, E x E y E z is 3 and B x P y B z is another 3. So, put together 6. We really need all, all 6 to describe a field tensor. But the point is that the field tensor is really a tensor. It is not really a 4 vector or anything. So, that is why we had to define it in this peculiar way. And that is why it was not at all obvious um, how the I mean. So, it is only when you re replace uh, the or, or express the electric and magnetic field in terms of potential then only you will be successful in linking uh, the electric and magnetic fields to 4 vectors because through the potentials. The potentials are 4 vectors, but the electric magnetic field themselves are not 4 vectors. They are components of a rank 2 tensor. Okay. So, in, in my book I have several exercises which I will encourage you to do on your own. So, perhaps I will assign these uh, exercises to you uh, in some of the tutorials that you will be encountering shortly. So, uh, so I am going to skip these assignments and uh, well these are not really assignments, these are worked out examples, but these are also things that you should try and do on your own. 
Okay, but uh, just to maintain the continuity of my uh, presentation, I will skip the examples because th those are meant to illustrate certain specific points which you should try to study on your own. So now let me go to the uh, basic uh, promise I made in the beginning, namely that every dynamical uh, system, the equations of every dynamical system can be thought of as the Euler-Lagrange equation of a suitable Lagrangian. Uh, so in other words, for example, Newton's second law is, can be thought of as basically some consequence of some Lagrangian. Exactly in the same way, I am going to see if I can uh, think of Maxwell's equations themselves as a consequence of a suitable, as the Euler-Lagrange equation of a suitable Lagrangian. Okay? So the question is, how would I do that? So to do that, I am going to first write down these four Maxwell's equations. The first two are the, uh, okay, so in other words, the second and third are the source-free Maxwell's equation. The first and fourth are the Maxwell's equation with sources. But the second and third Maxwell's equations which do not have sources are automatically obeyed by uh, re-expressing the electric and magnetic fields in terms of the corresponding potentials. So, when I do that and I insert it back into the sourced Maxwell's equation, so when I, so this automatically solves my source free Maxwell's equation, but then I am going to insert it into the Maxwell's equation with sources, okay. So, I get this, this result, okay. So, the claim is that uh, these equations namely 3.64 and 3.65 are basically the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation of some Lagrangian, okay. So, but uh, to do that, you see, I have to, uh, the, so the claim is that there is some Lagrangian whose Lagrange equations are these two sourced Maxwell equations. But then, in order to um, make this claim, of course, I have to first identify the generalized coordinates. So, it is clear what the generalized coordinates are because, you see, uh, this involves the time derivatives of the potentials. Uh, so, therefore, the generalized coordinates uh, are likely to be the scalar and vector potentials themselves. Okay. So, I am going to make that claim and then I am going to say that the Lagrangian should exist which has that property. Okay. And besides, uh, remember that this has the form. So, uh, you see this is my generalized coordinate. So, what do I mean by this? what is R? R takes on the role of some index i. So, so remember in a dynamical system with finite number of generalized coordinates, it would be labeled as q i, where i is uh, a discrete index like 1, 2, 3. So, you have a finite number of degrees of freedom in that situation. But here, we are talking about a field. So, a field not only has an infinitely many degrees of freedom, it also has a continuously infinite number of degrees of freedom. So, that means that i gets replaced by a continuous index called r vector. Okay. So, r vector plays the role of the index i. So, just as we would have written uh, for a system with finite number of generalized coordinates, we would have written the Lagrangian as the sum over all the uh, you know different coordinates. So, the Lagrangian due to the time derivatives of a you know say if you are talking about r theta phi, you would have uh, uh, m r dot squared plus r squared theta dot squared plus r squared sin squared theta phi dot squared. So, like that we would have written it uh, separately as uh, the um, dot product of the first generalized coordinate squared second etcetera etcetera. So, so that is what we would have written it if there were a finite number of generalized coordinates. But now that there are infinitely many of them, this summation over i gets replaced by an integral over r because uh, remember that i gets replaced by r. But then uh, the, because there are sources, so, so this is if there were no sources by I mean by implication that this uh, script L corresponds to the Lagrangian of a system with no sources. But if there are sources, we suspect that it is going to look like this. But now I am going to uh, postulate that. Uh, so, so, in other words, I have to now figure out what this is in order for the Euler-Lagrange equation of 3.66 to be exactly the same as 6, 4 and 6, 5. 
Okay, so uh, so obviously there are two equations, namely six four and six five, and uh, we expect uh, two Lagrange equations because one is with respect to phi, the other is with respect to a. So the the Euler-Lagrange equation for the phi is uh, basically this, and the Euler-Lagrange so it's a derivative with respect to uh, phi dot and d by dt of uh, dl by d phi dot is equal to dl by d phi. So, similarly d by dt of dl by d a dot is equal to dl by d a. So, these are the Euler Lagrange equations of uh, Lagrangian which we still do not know what it is, but uh, whatever it is it has to be uh, constructed in such a way that the equations that you have obtained 3.67 should be identical there, there are two equations in 3.65 and the one is the first one the second one. So, these two have to be respectively identical to 6, 4 and 6, 5. Okay. So, the question is how would you achieve that? So, uh, so the way we achieve that is by choosing the rest of the Lagrangian in this way. Okay. Okay, first of all uh, uh, look uh, if you look at 6, 4 it does not have d by dt of phi, it only has d by dt of a. So, that implies that the Lagrangian should be independent of d by dt of phi. Okay. So, which is why I have chosen it to be this. So, so you will see that uh, this will now involve, so the all the phi dependence has been extracted. So, this is all there is to the phi dependence. Now, I have to convince you that this is in fact correct was of course, I have not told you what this is, but this I will tell you later, but even not knowing what this is uh, because the phi dependence has been extracted sufficient for us to reproduce at least 3.64. So, to do that uh, find the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi, then you will see that it is basically equal to one half of yeah. So, so it is uh, basically uh, going to be equal to so this is this is going to be a Dirac delta function. Okay, and whereas uh, this this of course uh, source so it's unrelated so that's zero. And this is going to give you uh, so this sort of thing is uh, is been evaluated here. So this is all zero because these two don't uh, unrelated to phi. So this is all zero. Okay, only this matters. So, uh, so when you do that, you get this this result. Okay, so I, I have skipped some steps. So, bottom line is that if you if you go ahead and insert this in your Euler-Lagrange equations here, you will exactly get this. Okay, so I have skipped a few steps which you have to fill in. But bottom line is that uh, this this particular choice is sufficient for you to reproduce uh, the first of these equations 3.64. So, similarly you can figure out the rest of the Lagrangian. So, to see that I have not told you what this is. So, so I have to fix that as well. So, based upon the rest of these observations, so you can so this equation has to reproduce 3.65. So, the question is how would you select L dash so that it does that. So, the rest of it uh, is basically uh, recovered in a similar way. So, you compare the phi equation with the answers and the A equation with the answers and then you will be able to uh, successfully show that the Euler uh, Lagrange equations of the, uh, this Lagrangian. So, this is the final answer. So, if you select this to be your Lagrangian you can uh, show. Uh, so, even if you did not follow the constructive derivation of that uh, you see I have actually uh, tried to argue how to construct the Lagrangian from Maxwell's equation. So, even if uh, that constructive uh, proof of the Lagrangian is something you did not follow you can certainly do the reverse that is assume that this is the Lagrangian and then try to derive the uh, Lagrange equations or the Euler Lagrange equation of this Lagrangian assuming uh, phi and a are your generalized coordinates in which case you are guaranteed to obtain the Maxwell equations right. So, the sourced Maxwell equations. Okay, so, so that completes the Lagrangian description of the electromagnetic field because we have successfully written down a Lagrangian whose Lagrange equations are precisely the Maxwell's equations. 
So, the question is, uh, so this is uh, as far as the Lagrangian formalism is concerned. So, in the next class, I am going to discuss the Hamiltonian formulation of the electromagnetic field. Because you see, uh, I have told you repeatedly that uh, both have their advantages. The Lagrange, the Lagrange formalism is useful because it is the first uh, uh, example where you study a dynamical system using generalized coordinates, uh, paying attention to constraints without knowing all the components of the forces. So, it, is, it first teaches you how to bypass having to know all the constraint forces. But then the Hamiltonian approach is advantageous in a, for a different reasons. One, one is of course that uh, uh, quantum mechanics is traditionally described in terms of Hamiltonians, although there is no reason why it should because Lagrangians also are equally useful in doing quantum mechanics. I am going to discuss that a bit later. But uh, the more important technical reason is that uh, symmetries uh, are uh, naturally described in terms of flows uh, in the Hamiltonian language. So, uh, so dynamical symmetries and other kinds of symmetries encountered in Noether's theorem are described as flows which uh, ap appear naturally in the context of Hamiltonian mechanics. So, it is important to be able to describe a dynamical system both in terms of Lagrangians as well as in terms of Hamiltonians. So, now that we have successfully uh, described the Lagrangian uh, formulation of uh, Maxwell's equation, we should be able to go ahead and now describe the Hamiltonian uh, analog of the same system. So, that is something I am going to do in the next class. So, until then uh, take care. So, I am stopping now. Mm -hmm.